Daily Gun Show. We come to you live every weeknight, ideally, at midnight Eastern. Uh, for about an hour, we talk about guns, and times like this, when we're on the road, we talk about the Gun Show Loophole Tour, and we talk about gun shops, and we talk about our Second Amendment, and I talk to myself. I don't know if Psycho's in here or not. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. So, uh, got some links out there. The show's been inconsistent, so... Can't expect people to always jump in when we're not here every night, but uh, we're back again tonight. Uh, just traveled through Wisconsin for quite a while, actually, and uh, we'll talk about some of the Wisconsin shops tonight. We'll talk about having useful conversations with anti-2A people, uh, and then we'll deal with uh, file storage, since on Mondays the idea would be to talk about behind the scenes, how to do stuff online. Uh, make some of that easier to deal with and uh, like understand it, it make the uh, understanding more uh, get a grasp of the what we're doing online all right so it's Monday it's uh, episode 660 something I don't like today's episode so we're not going to talk about that but uh, we're inching up on episode 700 so uh, that's a, a mile marker I guess I want to thank everybody who does show up and uh, participate in the conversations over on the Gun Channel side. Gun Channels is a community we built it's about five years ago now. It's a place where people can get together and have conversations on guns and 2A things. And uh, we run it on YouTube only because Night Strike hasn't got the functionality of GunTube together yet. But we're looking forward to the chance to flee from the stupid YouTube platform which is crippling everyone in their ability to use the internet. So, uh, you know, we acknowledge that there's people over there, but we're going to be paying always more attention to the people on gun channels. A couple of our people put money towards gun channels every month. And uh, it's disrespectful to them and their money and the time they spent earning that money to, uh, to use a platform that sucks. So I'm going to pay less and less attention to that YouTube platform, even though we have to use it only because Night Strike hasn't got gun tube up and running yet. So, uh, at least for the live stuff. So, uh, digging into useful conversations with anti-2A people. Uh, Cycle, feel free to jump in, but I just got back from the AMCON, second year of AMCON, which is what they're calling this, 2A Media Summit. It stands for Alternative Media something i forget and then convention anyhow it's a two-way media summit they bring some bloggers some radio people and uh they consider themselves podcasters together uh this year they brought a couple of youtubers in and they uh, disregarded instagram and memes and uh suggested that live chatting isn't effective or useful so uh one of the useful things they did talk about though at that uh media convention was dealing with people who are anti-gun or at least anti-second amendment or whatever we want to call it. So um, very often we use left, we use uh, liberal, we use Democrat, and all of those are off-putting to people who might be left or liberal or Democrat and still like guns. So if we truly want to have conversations with antis, I think one of the first resources we need is to realize that there are people who are on opposing political positions from us that might still be pro-firearms, pro-firearms owners' rights. So I think that was useful, and I'm going to make an effort. I don't usually say Democrats because that's inaccurate. Uh, I'll sometimes say left, and I'll sometimes say liberal. Less often liberal, after hanging out with Yankee for so long, I just don't feel that's accurate either. Um, and then left, uh, I think, you know, left and right as conservative and, I guess, uh, statist. But uh, 
uh, anyway, a lot of people who want to associate themselves with some of those words feel alienated when we use them to, can, to describe the uh, anti-firearm, anti-2A side. Uh, Cycle, you want to throw anything in on that? Well, I agree that, that I mean, uh, my Democratic uh, representative from my district that retired uh, last cycle around, uh, she was one of the most pro 2A people I ever met in my life. And, and you, you can't just say everybody Democratic and you can't really say everybody that's progressive. But the, the problem is that if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, you know, it's a duck. And the, the people, the people who are primarily, it seems that the people who are primarily anti-gun and anti-Second Amendment are the people that think the state should be taking care of you. So they're basically statists, collectivists, you know, uh, sort of people. And unfortunately, the progressives tend to fall into that category quite a bit. And uh, left, you're right, left is a relative term. Anybody that's on the left to me is leftist, right? So no matter where I'm standing, if you're to the left, you're you're left. And, and it, it's kind of hard because it's kind of relativistic. Exactly. And I think that was really the point. Um, this was brought up by, I think it was Sarah from Minnesota, um, who is, I forget what the name of it, call it. It's called the Minnesota Gun Owners something, but um, I think she considers, or she's part of like the liberal gun owner or something like that. Or maybe she had a button on it that said liberal gun owner. And, and again, I don't consider myself a statist or a liberal or any of that stuff either. And I don't consider myself anything really, but um, uh, certainly not that stuff. Um, but again, we, we, we hurt ourselves or our, our, our communication, our ability to communicate efficiently when we exclude people simply because of, you know, most people are like this. Because how do we know, honestly, if most people are like this? We're told that most people are like that, but we don't know. So um, there's really no difference between that and, and, you know, when they made that horrible call and said anybody who liked Trump was deplorable. Right. I mean, when, when you put people exactly. in great big buckets like that, it's very insulting. And I guess, you know, we don't see it as a massive insult. But imagine if you were, like you said, left of us somewhere and then you get grouped in with all the asshole weirdos who are way left. I'd be insulted with that, too. And really what it's about is communicating, right? Having effective communication with another person and effective communication with another person isn't proving you're right and it isn't proven that they're wrong or anything like that it's given and taken a little bit on both sides i don't mean compromise or second amendment protected rights of course but have a uh, uh, ability to actually understand where they're coming from and to speak in a way that doesn't uh, alienate them so i thought it was worthy to have them there to describe that uh, as quote, unquote, liberal gun owners, because uh, they took quite offense to some of the casual, nonchalant references to the left or to the Democrats. And trust me, at the 2A AMCON, or how we're supposed to call it, um, if you listen to my rogue live cast that I did, because we weren't, I wasn't supposed to broadcast it, but I did, um, they, they definitely use a lot of the old, I'm going to call it FUD you know, FUD media, it's not new media, it's not old media, it's just old fashioned uh, on the newer platforms. But yeah, they'll certainly use the word Democrats when they're referring to them. And obviously that's, you know, think about it. If you're anywhere near considering yourself, maybe not a Democrat or a Republican, just because you share a position, you don't want to be grouped in like we're saying. So we don't need to preach the choir, open your minds, understand that we're trying to further conversation, not prove with every breath that we're right and they're wrong. And if you're of an open enough mind to want to have a useful conversation, then consider some of that. Consider sh jumping on the show and participating in the actual conversation here. Uh, sure, I mean, DT Piper makes a good point. You know, not all the people that are on the so-called right or conservative or Republican are pro-gun either. We definitely see that, especially with Trump's position today that in a few weeks or a few days or whatever he said, he's going to sign off or right away, uh, right off, whatever he phrased it, bump fire stock. So yeah, he's anti-gun as they come in Republican clothing. Oh, what did I just close? Dang, I just closed something. 
I think I just closed the gun channel. Sorry. Dang it. Um, well, maybe, no. maybe local. Well, Pfeiffer, you know, Pfeiffer puts another thing out there. It's just, which I strongly disagree with, by the way, which is why I'm going to mention. He says, if we really want to make progress with restoring two way rights, then we need to make it a nonpartisan issue. Yes. And that's very difficult because while you don't want to say all Democrats think like a certain way, a major thrust of their party is gun control. Oh, it doesn't so, matter. Um, so if so you can't to... really say, let's make it nonpartisan when the other side has a vested interest in that being one of their big stumping points. Well, that's you know, that'd, be, that'd, that'd be like saying, let's point. make a woman's right to choose a nonpartisan issue. Well, I'm sorry. That ain't going to happen. Okay, but just because three is an odd number, all numbers are not. So I hear you, but there's a hell of a lot of other people that are anti-gun that aren't Democrats. So you're right, the Democrats as a whole hate guns, but to suggest that, you know, in, for effective conversation that we're just going to clump them together, uh, then I don't agree. So, no, I, all, I was, all I was trying to say was if you try to say it's a nonpartisan issue when there's been a clear line divided, a partisan line established by one of the parties. That that's not true, though, Cycle. We just talked about Trump, a Republican in every single respect, attacking guns. So Democrats hate guns, but so do Republicans, honestly. So we've had all kinds of horrible shit happen to us from Republicans. So it's partisan. Yeah, it's both partisans are against our rights. So it's up to us as individuals to to, to, to clear through that. Anyway, I, I think he might have worded it to say uh, we have to keep politics out of the conversation. At least that was the gist of the advice from the um, uh, two-way summit. And that was the last part I was going to bring up about that is if you're talking about any single issue, as soon as you muddy the waters with other issues, you alienate people on your particular point. And we have a very important point here with the Second Amendment protected rights. And if we're going to, again, try to be efficient in our conversation, and it, even though it doesn't seem like it to us, by throwing a Democrat word in there, saying, you know, Democrat, bringing politics into it, it can turn people off. So imagine if someone was to try to sell you something and they started talking about their feelings. I'm assuming you're going to be like me. You're tuning it out. Boom, I'm done. I don't care about your feelings. You're not selling me anything with your feelings, right? So if we're trying to have a conversation where we're trying to sway them on their opinion of our Second Amendment protected rights, and then we lump them in with Democrats casually without even thinking about it, that could seriously offend them. And we've lost them as far as they're getting our message across. So I understand that, like I say, we all have opinions and I don't think I disagree with you on you know, the technical part there, but I think what I'm trying to get across is there's some, some changes that have to be made. Obviously the, 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 the established battle lines, trenches aren't moving. So in order to start moving them, we have to think outside the box a little bit, maybe think about it from the other person's perspective. If we can have a conversation strictly about the rights protected by the second amendment, and not bring part of politics in at all, we certainly want, wouldn't want to bring up abortion, right? Going to an extreme. We wouldn't want to bring up healthcare, maybe. You know, we, we're going to leave some things out of it if we're talking about specifically firearms. And their recommendation was leave all those words out of it. They're not necessary. They don't add to it, except when we're preaching to the choir. And then in that case, we're honestly not doing ourselves a favor if we are to generalize and persecute whole groups of people who may actually, some of them might be on our side with this one issue. Any heads, it wouldn't be easy. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be easy either. Um, I'm super tired, so I'm trying to whip through this so that I don't fall asleep in the middle of the show. <laughs> <clears throat> so again, this is meant to start conversations. Uh, this isn't supposed to be an entertainment show where you sit back and you learn or you sit back and everything's answered. Instead, we want to uh, uh, just put some ideas out there, some kernels, maybe take them to your own show, take them to a conversation in real life at the gun shop, at the gun range, and uh, and elaborate on them. Uh, we're going to do a member of the day. Do I have anybody in here? Let's make it DTP. We don't, know, we don't uh, acknowledge his uh, participation enough, and I do appreciate that you're over on the gun channels having this conversation with us and uh, I want to, again, acknowledge you're out there all the time. So really do appreciate your support uh, of the gun channels and of the shows that are out here. And uh, my stuff particularly, I notice you out there a lot. So it's the reason we built gun channels five years ago. I didn't know it, but built it for you, man. Thanks.
I'm assuming you're a dude, but whatever. <coughs> um, we do try to feature a member of the day. I don't do it enough, but going forward, it should be a little bit easier. I've got a couple of appointments this week, and then I have much less uh, work to do. So we'll be able to concentrate on the show a bit more and do more updates from the road and some videos and stuff. Uh, so again, appreciate everybody that's dealing with the uh, sporadic nature of the show for the last uh, couple of bit here, I guess 18 days while I've been on the road. Uh, we did manage to squeeze out a uh, van chat last night. So there's some updates on the on the van and stuff over there. Um, dealing with files and storage. Um, you've been around computers for a long time. Now that you're dealing with videos and photos from things like Wanamaker from your vacations and stuff, got any tips or tricks for people who might think of it as frustrating or foreign for just saving files and storing files? Oh, it's all in organization. And it's all in good. You know, it's, it's kind of unfortunate that, that you can't put metadata on pictures and stuff. You, you kind of have to depend on a, a, like a hierarchical storage structure. But it's unfortunate that you can't put the metadata on local files that you can on uh, uh, the things you do on the web. I mean, that's one of the great things about the Internet is you have all these metadata and tags and stuff to make it easier for you to find things after you leave them out there. But uh, generally speaking, I find that the, the, the biggest thing with me is to not leave stuff all just in a big lump and, and to start you know, categorizing them and, 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 uh, uh, substruct, you know, subdirectoring them to, so that they make sense. And I'm sure there's a lot of, there's probably products out there that will allow you to do that kind of stuff, but then you get into this whole database thing. I mean, you know, I took like 700 pictures when I was in Norway, I'm not going to sit down and go through 700 individual pictures and put tags on all of them. It just, I mean, it would take longer than a trip. Yeah, and unless you've got some like passionate interest in doing something like that, it's just a massive waste of time, really, because you're probably not going to need to recall each and every one. But like you say, if you've been to a museum and you put all those pictures in a folder called such and such museum, you do that same thing for all the different things you might have hit. Uh, then you store them. I usually do the same thing. I'll say for like, for example, for this trip, I bought a new hard drive, a little two terabyte external drive. It's a little bit. It's about the size of a pack of cigarettes. It's got like a one foot cord on it. I put a little piece of Velcro on it. I put another piece of the other side of Velcro on the back of the laptop monitor. And that way they can physically be attached. Uh, so I don't misplace it or whatever when I'm moving the laptop around or putting it in a bag. Uh, but however you physically have a hard drive, um, I'll then start out by creating a folder for pictures and a separate folder for videos and a separate folder for the dash cam. That's just my personal way of doing it. Um, the videos then uh, inside the I'll open up one of the folders and then I created a since I'll be on the road for a while a September and an October and a November folder and I opened up the September folder and I made a folder for each day of the month then I just copied all those folders and put them into the video folder and I copied all those and I put them into the dash cam folder so now I have three folders and they each have 30 or whatever identical you know September 1 through September 30th folders in there. So I got a bunch of empty potential. And then as I start to pull stuff off the phone and I pull my videos off the dash cam and I start to sort them, I'll go through and then let's say I went to a gun shop on September 28th. I'll in that folder create a folder called whatever the name of the gun shop is and grab those pictures and put them in there. So now I can search on my hard drive for the name of the gun shop if I needed to and the folder will come up. I can recollect that it happened in September, so I could poke through the different folders and find it that way. And like you say, I don't need to then label each picture, you know, with the name of the gun shop and the date and all that. Um, there's a million different ways you could sort it, but definitely um, batching them and, and naming folders is probably one of the easiest ways. Um, like I mentioned, I use uh, external drive. It's basically a laptop hard drive with the little spinning plates. So it's not super expensive, but it's semi-fragile compared to an SSD drive. I don't think there's anything perfect. So lots of different options out there. They all have their benefits and their disadvantages. 
but uh, honestly, everything these days is getting better and better and more dependable and, and probably longer term. It's tough to know how long stuff is going to last. Everything degrades. All digital stuff is built on some kind of physical stratus, physical material, and that material has a lifespan. Um, either magnetic or physical characteristics of it will break down. So don't assume that you put something on a CD 16 years ago and it's still on there. You're going to want to do some sort of uh, backups. I find the cloud useful nowadays, especially for just plain old pictures. You know, as long as they're not super personal or anything, uh, you know, with, with you know, private data on it, uh, just pictures from a vacation or something, um, Again, taking those from years ago and putting them up on the cloud, maybe restructuring them or re reorganizing them, uh, gives you a backup and it gives you an opportunity to reorganize. So a lot of times what I'll do when I take some whatever system I've got for saving files, I'll go through my maybe like last month's files during a live chat one day and I'll open up one of my cloud storage places, either Google Drive or Dropbox or there's lots of different places you can store things online. And uh, I'll just open up the two windows and I might go through an entire month's worth of photos and pull out all the food. And on my cloud drive, I might organize it differently. So I'll have you know food, a folder called food and a folder called dog or a folder called van. And then in those folders, spaghetti or you know fish or something. And then uh, take all the pictures from a month and throw them in there. So now if I need to find just some pictures for stock or for reference or something, just a picture of the dog in the desert or something, you know, I know a folder I can go find that in without having to remember what day it was that I took a picture of the dog out in the desert. Um, so sometimes by uh, giving yourself double storage, you have an opportunity to reorganize and search for things different ways. Yeah, it, it, I'll actually sometimes even put a picture in multiple directory structures for just that same reason, because I don't have the ability to put the metadata along with it. And and I you know I I try to solve this problem. I have a pretty extensive music library of sheet music, and I actually uh, tried writing a uh, an application to do it once, and I'll tell you it's not easy. So that you can go back and and cross search stuff based on what part it is or what topic it is or that kind of stuff. And especially with pictures and videos, it is, it is so hard because they're not, you know, they're not, um, geez, they're not searchable elements. You know, the uh, documentation files and stuff, you can search for key pieces of text, you know, or inside the document. But when you do videos and, and, uh, and, uh, and what do you call it? Uh, uh, pictures and stuff, images, you're, you you just can't do that. No, nope. and it'll be scary. Eventually, we'll have optical or, or uh, what is it, a quantum or something that can do that. But right now, we can't. And I don't know if we want to be around when, when computers can figure all that out. But I'm sure they well, will. Well, really, it, to be honest with you, it's not. A, it's a fairly trivial problem to solve on the storage uh, at the storage level because all you have to have is a a cross indexing system that allows you to store the equivalent of tags and metadata associated with your files. And the problem is that it's all external now. You can't, it's not part of the operating system. And if, if you know, that, I, that'll probably be the, you know, maybe they won't do it because the net kind of does that and everything will be in the cloud and all your cross-indexing will be done in the cloud. You know, maybe someday, it's really kind of funny because we keep going, we're actually kind of going backwards like to the old mainframe days where everything was on a mainframe and you just had a stupid terminal to look at it. And now you're going to have these stupid laptops and 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 iPads and and tablets and stuff, and all your crap, all the heavy duty lifting is going to be up in the is up in the cloud. So it's really kind of funny how that stuff is cycling around. For sure. Do you, have you do you know the story, the short story, Isaac Asimov's The Last Question? Oh yes, yes. So uh, we'll just leave it at that. And if you're curious at all, it's like maybe 20 minutes, and you can get a version on YouTube of Isaac Asimov reading it. He says it's one of his favorite stories. I think it is my favorite story from him. And uh, that's basically what we are just talking about, but uh, suggest you go check that out. It's, it's awesome. Um, so that's a little bit of storing stuff on the cloud or storing, dealing with files and storage. Uh, lots and lots and lots of strategies there. It's like suggesting uh, how do you wanna 
you know, set up your car? How do you want to set up your kitchen? You, you know, you can do it a billion different ways and you might change. I've certainly changed over the years the way I do it. And I know that what I'm doing now isn't perfect. It's just, you know, an iteration of it. And uh, I'll continue to, to fiddle with it. And again, this is designed to wet your whistle. Feel free to take this to another conversation or one of the live lobbies and, and have something to discuss that's uh, hopefully useful and allows you to do your efforts easier. All right. So with that, uh, we're pretty much getting in through it. Um, thanks for Cycle for jumping in here. I don't know how interested you are to talk about the shops in Wisconsin, but that's what I'm going to talk about a bit. So got a giant project I'm working on and I, while I'm on the gun show loophole tour, I still have to you know, pay bills. And this project is allowing me to be on the tour along with my Patreons. So uh, I needed to work on that. Uh, so I did less mileage and more uh, parking and, and working on stuff. So um, kind of moseyed from Chicago uh, through Wisconsin over the last week or so, really. So I had an opportunity to check out um, quite a few shops. Uh, unfortunately, a bunch of them were on Sunday. So some of them were closed. I checked out Lawyer, Lawyer, Law, Lauer Custom Weaponry. You heard of that place? The place that created Duracoat? No, I've never heard of that. They call themselves the I, I can't believe you got through Chicago without being shot. Oh, yeah. Not even an issue. <laughs> I mean, it's certainly, um, you know, different, especially for me from Arizona. I don't think about it. I always have a gun in my pocket period. I just don't even think about it. I can drive almost the entire country without even thinking about it. I just have to worry. Really, my only concern when I drive through different states is whether or not they have a duty to inform. You know, when you get pulled over, if you get pulled over, um, you know, whether or not you have to inform the, the you know, law enforcement officer that you got a permit or not, because I'm not used to that in Arizona. It's not something I do normally. So um, anyway, that's about normally all I have to worry about. Illinois was certainly, uh, you know, a, a sharp slap in the face to have to deal with, even just for a few days like that, the kind of you know stuff that Dano and Grimm and Mule and others who live in in Illinois have to deal with daily for yeah. every. So uh, definitely interesting, but no, I wasn't. I mean, no, we live in the safest country in the world. I'm not too worried about. Well, one of the safest countries in the world. I'm not too worried about getting killed or nothing. The uh, stuff that happens that's violent is pretty much all uh, confined to, you know, drug, uh, we call it territory type of crap. Yeah. So, oh, uh, it's really gang based. Yeah. So, you know, obviously you can't pick when that's going to happen, but I wasn't really anywhere near gang warfare or anything like that or just randomness. So, um, no, I wasn't too concerned, but, uh, yeah, I also have to worry about that when I get to Minnesota. Uh, disarming, it's a little different in Minnesota. Oh, Talk really? This man chat. Well, in Illinois, you have to have a, an FOID, a firearms owner identification. And since you can't have that without being a resident, it's sort of a catch-22. You can, the, the Firearms Owner Protection Act of 1986, which was generally pro-Second Amendment, it was pro-gun owner, except for the freaking Hughes Amendment, which banned, you know, further manufacture of machine guns after, what, 86. So um, the rest of the Firearms Owner Protection Act lived up to its name. And one of the elements of it was the right to travel. So states like New York and New Jersey were basically arresting anybody who went through the state with a firearm, because as soon as you enter the state, you don't you oblige with their laws or obey their laws. So um, the federal government said, no, you really can't do that. So you have to allow people to travel through your state. So Illinois allows that, but that they hold it to the letter of law, just like New York. You have to travel through our state. You stop for gas, you're not traveling anymore. You stop to get something to eat, you're certainly not traveling. You stop to look at a museum or something, you're not traveling. You know, you're stopping, you're visiting. And yeah, that's a destination. destination. Yeah. Yeah, and that means you you are somewhere in Illinois in with in possession of a firearm, even if it's locked in the trunk, and you don't have an FOID. So, you know, you, you're in a catch twenty two. So, if you have a destination like a hotel or a place that you're going to, that's I think a little different because now you are traveling to the place, and now you left the gun there. It's safe and it's legal. And now you drive around the state without your firearm. You're good to go. You can go to a gas station. You can go to a restaurant. You can go to a museum. 
uh, then you can pick up that firearm from the place that you left it and leave. Now, you can't just hand your firearm off to a friend because that would be an interstate handgun transfer and that would be illegal. You can't uh, just leave it laying around. That would be irresponsible. So you basically have to rent a place or have family where you can put something that would be secure and safe. So it's super difficult, whereas Minnesota doesn't have that element of it. So I can't carry my firearm in my pocket here, but I can have it. You know, I can own it. So uh, it's a little comf more comfortable when you get to Minnesota. But um, either way, Wisconsin's awesome. You can do whatever you want in Wisconsin. So uh, traveled up from uh, the middle of the state, Rockford, and that takes you up into Madison, which is the capital of Wisconsin. And it's sort of an interesting little town, uh, city, I guess, where, uh, there's like this big lake. Imagine a big lake and somebody drew a line through it. And that line is like a, a little bridge of land. So there's kind of like a lake that looks like two letter D's back to back. And on that little strip of land is where they have their state capital. So it's kind of a weird little city kind of in the middle of a lake. And, uh, it's a neat town, but it's uh, also got the university of Madison or university of Wisconsin or something there. And it's, uh, mm -hmm super hippie like type of place. So anti-gun and uh, the gun shops are sort of in a ring around the town because uh, it's still Wisconsin and there's still plenty of hunting and just recreational shooting and stuff. So kind of interesting, check out a couple of the shops. Um, one of them I was kind of, like I say, looking for parking lots to be able to do work in. And I happened to be near a shop that was open a couple of shops that were open actually, but one of them caught my eye on Google. You know, I'm letting Google help me recommend stores. I didn't, I kept asking on Instagram and places and nobody had really given me any near me. Everybody was giving me suggestions over in Milwaukee and Milwaukee was a couple of hours east of me. And uh, like I said, I wasn't really driving so much last week as parking and working. So I was looking for targets opportunity that were close by and I was letting Google help me with that. And if you have, look for something on Google. Like if you go to Google maps and you say, show me the gun shops nearby, it'll show you all kinds of steakhouses and dollar stores and it, Google's an idiot, but it will tell you some of the gun shops. And when you find one, uh, you can click on it and get the, sometimes a picture, uh, but then more often than not, some reviews of the shop. And I look at those reviews, they give me an idea if it's you know, if it's a standalone shop, if it's a giant big box type of store, if it's like a strip center, if it's brand new, you know, you get some idea from the comments, the flavor of the shop. And I found one that stood out to me. It had all five star ratings. And, you know, these people know what they're doing. Great shop. And then uh, one review had one star. So uh, I look at that one star review and it said something to the effect of bait and switch. They don't offer what's online. Treat this place like a bad mechanic or something or a bad plumber. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's interesting. But then they had a response from the owner and it had something that it said something to the effect of your wife came in looking for a high point 45 and we have it on our website, but we don't have every gun in our website in our inventory that would cost too much. So we offered to order it for, and it would have taken two days. However, that's, you know, I forget what he said, but basically we all know what a high point is. So he basically said, this isn't the kind of thing you want for home defense. So our employee tried to offer a better option. It wasn't an upsell. And sorry for your misunderstanding. If you'd like to come in, we can help explain that to you both. And uh, I just thought that was a, you know, an interesting situation. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, just a, yeah, excellent response to it. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go check out this shop. This sounds like a, a shop that has their head on their shoulders. And I got there. Uh, turns out the shop's been around for a long, long time. The current owner bought the name and the business and then moved it uh, town over uh, because of political situations. <coughs> so kind of, you know, the, he bought the name and the inventory and probably the customer base that wanted to move along and then uh, moved the shop physically over. And it's been there, I think he said seven years. I'd have to look at my notes, but uh, it's called the ammo box and the building it's in is just a cool looking building. It's got like, uh, I don't know, maybe a 1970s kind of architectural feel to it, but it really kind of physically looks like an ammo box. So I thought it was cool and uh, has some character and looks unique in the area. But um, I ended up going in and there was only one guy there. And it turns out he had come out of retirement to help keep the shop open. They had some weird hours. It was like closed Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then some 
minor hours on Thursday and Friday and open Saturday full hours or something. Well, it turns out the owner of the shop, you know, in order to keep ends met, he's working, his day job is running a garbage truck for the town. So he basically has to open the shop when he's not working. And this guy came out of retirement so that he could open the shop an extra day on Thursday. And I think that's when I showed up. So uh, anyway, I'd, I'd mentioned, since the guy was real talkative and cool, I mentioned that the reason I stopped by is because of that interaction on their Google thing. And he said, oh, yeah, I remember that. Uh, I, he was the employee, you know, and the boss wasn't there who made the response, but it was just cool. You know, we all know what a high point is. We all know what, what went down. You know, it was just neat to see, you know, that somebody was dealing with the same kind of struggles we have when we, you know, are talking to our friends who are basically, you know, same place. Hey, I want to buy a gun. This one looks like it's cheap. Why shouldn't I start there? Um, oh, it's a cool little shop. They had a lot of, uh, collectible stuff. I bought all their oilers. They had a whole bunch of Kalashnikov uh, Soviet oilers for you know, oil bottles. Those things always are neat. A lot of people collect them. So I just bought all they had. I wanted to leave money there. And uh, neat shop. They had a lot of com block stuff. I got the impression that back in the day, the guy probably bought a bunch of stuff or maybe the previous owner or whatever had it and they just kind of moved it over. But they don't appreciate what they've got. They just got a lot of neat variety of stuff i think i took some pictures of their can openers and uh but their uh, sks bandoliers had all kinds of chinese writing on them i know people that are into collecting that stuff really like to see the the stamps you know the ink stamps that they'll put on the back who knows what they say but um maybe somebody does but uh you know it's just neat because a lot of times that stuff got so used when you get surplus all that stuff's kind of washed out or you know gone bleached out um otherwise a bunch of tannerite hunting stuff and uh just an overall neat shop oh i think the other neatest thing about it or another neat thing about it was their whole rack of used rifles was on m16 racks those modular m16 racks that you'll see in an armory and it took me a minute to even realize that's what it was but that's kind of neat to see like 16 of those things with a bunch of shotguns and stuff in them <laughs> uh, otherwise i went to another shop that turned out to be a, a, a this was a little bit out of town maybe like towards let's say a fishing destination or something and it was the kind of shop you'd expect to see in like a little sleepy fishing village uh that was a grocery store for the longest time the current owners inherited it from their parents so i guess the mom or the the mother and father of the guy tom uh owned the shop as a grocery store back in the day for a long long time they inherited the current owners tom and his wife inherited it from his parents and uh, in 1978, they started to incorporate firearms into this little country store. So it used to be just a little country store selling cheese or whatever they sell in Wisconsin. And then uh, in 78, he started to introduce firearms into it. And then by 2000, the firearms had become basically the store. So they switched it from a grocery store and gun shop to just a gun shop. And of course now, you know, after 13, they're suffering. But uh, interesting little shop. Uh, mostly turkey hunting. I really didn't even think about how much turkey hunting there is in Wisconsin, but uh, the guy does woodworking. So he did a lot of the little wooden things you'd put your mounts on, either turkeys or deers or racks or whatever it might be. Uh, some of them are in the shape of Wisconsin or just different things. It was kind of cool. And then uh, just neat to see somebody who's efforting to keep his shop open by providing more than just the firearms, right? They had a raffle going and they were also real proud of the fact that they've had a, they've sponsored a youth sh turkey hunt for, I think she said 20 years or something. So um, kids in the area look forward to that and participate. And I guess there's a big like cookout at the end, but basically like free guided turkey hunts for these kids. And it's just neat to see a shop that's not only doing something like that, but proud of it. You know, they didn't have to, to bring that up, but they, they were proud of it. So Neat to see a, a, a shop that's, again, active in the community, been there for a long time. And uh, in fact, as I was packing up, I was talking to the wife most of the time, the husband kind of in and out. It turns out he was setting up uh, in front of the shop a bunch of like tables and stuff. I think it was uh, like a fish fry or something. They were getting ready to do some sort of like you know, fish fry out in front of the store. So uh, it's kind of neat to see shops doing stuff that's... Uh, I don't know, we consider it outside the box over here, but I'm sure they just consider it tradition up there. And that's part of the goal of the tour is to, to show some of the different things that shops are doing to stay relevant, to keep money coming in and to uh, be parts of their community. So maybe some of the other shops can you know pick things here and there. 
Uh, let's see. So that was that was down by Madison. Then I, I basically would run out of juice on the intern on the auxiliary, auxiliary batteries here in the van. So I would drive for a while and park and then explore whatever gun shops and then get back to work. So I found some other shops just as I was leaving. I had to uh, you know, disarm going into Minnesota. So um, I found a shop right as I was leaving. And just again, like Google, like I, as I was leaving the state, I just like Google tell me where the gun shops are. And it took me to one right off the highway. Really cool, really cool shop. I'm really impressed by the ways that, in fact, I'm, I'm impressed, but I'm also getting kind of frustrated with the shops in Arizona because I never put much thought into it, but pretty much every shop in Arizona just takes their handguns and puts them in a glass case and that's it. I have not seen that very often. I mean, occasionally up here, there's stuff in glass cases in Illinois where you're not allowed to hold a gun without an FOID. They pretty much keep their stuff in, in glass cases just to avoid the hassle, I'm sure. But uh, man, just, just just the coolest display of their rifles and stuff, you know, just impressive. You walk in and you go, wow, you can't help it. It's just neat. And I think that's an aspect of a gun shop that, you know, they have that potential. And if they don't live up to it, they're wasting the potential. But if they've got an inventory of hundreds of guns, why not display those in a way that make people go, wow, that's cool. Because who wouldn't want to come in and just be part of that? You know, if you got 400 guns and they're all in a corner behind you and you're some, you know, guard of those guns and you can't even see them unless you, some, you ask somebody and you have to decide which gun you want to look at. It's such a different experience than just going in and being immersed with guns from your knees to over your head and just seeing like, you know, four different varieties of something right on the wall where you can actually see the differences and maybe pick one up and see if it's really heavier or not. So I'm just blown away by some of the um, uh, presentations that these shops will do. And I don't know if they intentionally do it, but um, I really do think that they'll walk in their own front door and take a look. You know, I don't know how many shops do that or how many people think about that when you walk into a shop, but some shops are just like, oh yeah, I'm in a store of some sort. Oh, it's a gun store. You know, I had to look around for a minute. Oh yeah, it's a gun store. Other stores, you walk in and you're like, wow, I want to come back here. Like immediately, you're just like, wow, I, I like this place. And I've noticed that a bunch, uh, I guess in Illinois also, but uh, here in Wisconsin, I've seen a couple like that. I missed one um, in Eclair, Wisconsin spent some time there and uh, most of those shops were closed but that's where um lining kugels is made the beer oh yes. made in chippewa falls do you know what a chippewa indian is anybody ellis yeah your hill folk Wizard? <laughs> not right off hand no chippewa is fake they're Ojibwas, or you know, the Ojibwa tribe is what was actually up here. Chippewa is just the way the white people said it. So Chippewa Falls, where Lion and Kugel's made, is just a fake name. It's like uh, whatever they call like uh, you know, a bad spelling of like a yeah, mispronunciation. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I don't know if all those were like unintentional. I think sometimes they did it to piss off the tribes, you know, but I don't know. Anyway, I just thought that was interesting. Um, so anyway, it was Ojibwa Falls, but everybody pronounces it Chippewa Falls, is uh, the town just north of Eclair, Wisconsin. And I uh, went to that tour because it was Sunday. <clears throat> so was that yesterday? And I was thinking nothing's going to be open, right? It's uh, Sunday and everything's closed on Sundays around here. So I'll, uh, I'll take a look at this factory tour because I like looking at machines and factories. And this fact, the lining kugels, I don't know much about beer, but I know they've been around since before Prohibition. So... It's an interesting thing, like 175 years worth of brewing. That would be neat. So I go there and find the place finally. Uh, it's not actually at the factory. You have to go to some bar outside the factory to get in the tour. But uh, it's 10 bucks to take the tour, which I didn't care about too much, although I am cheap. And you got beer at the end, which I could almost care less about. I don't even want to drink the beer because I can't drive if I drink like any beer because I'm lightweight. I don't like beer, so I didn't really care at all about the beer they're going to give me, but they're going to give me five different kinds of beers, and I figured at least that would be interesting to see what the differences are between all these beers. But uh, the main thing is they wouldn't let me take pictures. So I said, screw it. I'm not going to take your tour. Give me my money back because <coughs> the only real interest I have is recording it you know, for the pictures. And uh, so now I don't even want to take this tour anymore, so I started looking at my phone, and, oh, there is one more gun shop, and it's like nine miles north. 
nine minutes north. I don't know how many miles that is. So I said, that's not that far. So I'm going to go this nine miles and it's out in the middle of houses. Like it's not commercial area. It's just houses. I call them horse properties in Arizona. I don't know what you call them out here, but you know, at least a half an acre or more size, you know, land and then a big house in the middle of it. Um, I'm like, all right, I'm going to give it a try. Cause most of the time when you check those out on, on Google, they're not going to have hours and they're not going to have a website listed. It's usually like a home FFL or something. So it's technically in there, but you don't just show up to their house because it's just showing up to their house. So um, this one had hours and everything. So I went, well, and it says it's open. So I figured, you know, there's a potential that that's just a mistake, but I'm going to drive up there anyway. I got nothing else to do. And I am super happy I went up there. It was one of the coolest shops I've seen. <laughs> really, really nice house in a really nice area like manicured nice you know looks good um and then just cool it was I, I just posted pictures of it on instagram with the big uh revolver as the mailbox and i don't think my pictures do justice you drive up into this guy's property basically and uh you kind of go up into trees and stuff and you find the place back there and it it's a garage or an outbuilding or whatever you want to call it and uh it's the owner and he's sitting in there and he's got a ton of handguns he's got a ton of rifles he's got a whole big chunk of it that's like leather couches and big recliners and stuff and a stove and a tv and coffee and stuff he's got cabinets in the middle that have like old stuff that they're just packed with old cool stuff like ammo boxes and magazines from the day and like cap guns and toys and just neat stuff to look at he says it's all for sale um then like a whole section like of useful stuff like holsters and um support gear magazines mag pouches and that kind of thing um he had awesome branding his his logo is a nagant and a revolver so it kind of tells you right away he's got collectibles and uh you know guns but uh just a cool dude and when i mentioned that i wanted to take some pictures for a podcast he was all into podcasts he knew a bunch of the firearms podcasts and stuff so just really cool. And, you know, you don't expect that on a Sunday, kind of nine miles north of the Line and Kugel factory. But if you're ever in that area, I would highly recommend checking out. I think it's called Tilden. I, can't, I think it's Tilden Guns. Just a super cool experience going in there. Again, his presentation was awesome. All his handguns are on slat wall from about your waist to your shoulders. And everything is just there. You can check it out. You know, it's got a whole line of whatever, Glocks or SIGs or whatever it might be. So you can see the various differences between a compact or a subcompact and uh, <clears throat> just a really cool shop. Um, next one, I'm just going to do one more because I can't keep remembering them all, is uh, Surplus Store. Um, I do myself a disservice. So I type in Surplus Store all the time. And I couldn't find nothing in like Illinois or wisconsin and it was bugging me because there's got to be a surplus store in illinois or wisconsin somewhere right so it hit me type in army navy because a lot of places call themselves army navy stores and i found one that was open and uh just the weirdest little army navy surplus store ever it's in a strip center with like real estate people and like maybe a jewelry store like a fur store like a high-end little ship stripe shopping center still called army navy you go in there and it's a lot, mostly new stuff. There was a little bit of surplus, maybe, maybe 15% surplus, but mostly not the crap you'd buy at like Ace Hardware as far as like camping gear, but like, you know, one or two steps higher than that. Um, the kind of stuff you'd get at like a popular or uh, whatever those stores are called now, like the big box outdoor stores. Uh, less inventory or less variety, but, you know, decent stuff. It wasn't just the garbage like, it, like I say, the hardware store version of camping gear. Um, but what's neat is they had an upstairs and a downstairs. And I said, can I take some pictures? He says, why? And I said, because of the podcast and all that. So he says, oh, yeah, be sure to take pictures of the cats. <sighs> what? So I go downstairs and, uh, you know, like a basement of a place. It's all nice, though. It's not like gloomy like a basement. They got it all carpeted and it's all fresh down there. But... Um, they sold some kind of socks. I can't remember the names. I'm not a big sock person, I guess, but some brand of socks that I guess are tough to, to get in person. So they're real proud of it. They got like half of their basement. It's just this brand of socks. But then the other half of the basement was all name tags. Um, 
either for human beings, but then they also had a big section for dogs, um, service dogs and, and that kind of thing. So like the various, you know, patches that might say do not pet or you know, don't, whatever, all those different instructions you see on service dogs, they make all that stuff in-house. And then of course, any kind of patch you might want, they make all that in-house. So it's just neat. It turns out that they again had inherited the company and then, you know, added on to it by doing the the embroidery stuff and then uh, I caught on and they, I forget the name of the company, but it's something like dog collars, USA.com or something. And I guess they're, they've got like a national reach now and they get all kinds of people that love their, their collars and stuff. So I did get a collar for Mello, um, a multi-cam collar. I want to leave money at the stores all the time. So uh, they also had like a big bin of quarter patches, 25 cent patches. I mean, I've seen everything in here is a buck. And I've seen things where like everything in here is a quarter, but then it's just garbage. Right? It's like just like the, the stuff that you'd throw away from packaging is weird stuff. And usually a quarter bin, their quarter bin had all kinds of cool stuff. You know, the UN logo, I got like five UN patches that are brand new, like good to go. Perfect UN patches for a quarter. I, I they were closing. Otherwise it would have, you know, just taken the whole box of stuff, but I didn't have time to root through the whole thing, but Wow, what a neat thing to see a quarter box. How often do you see a quarter box? All right, I've talked myself up. So I don't know if you guys want to add anything. We were talking a bit about having conversations with antis at the beginning of the show. And then we talked a bit about uh, how to save and store files. Right. What's that? What kind of files? You know, on the computer. Oh, any strategies or? Mm. I normally just make up a folder and group everything into that folder that you know has anything to do with the subject matter. It's simple, I know, but it works for me. Anything else from anybody? Uh, let's not forget that uh, today is the second. Every second matters. Well, almost. Maybe this one. It is here. <laughs> My computers are telling me it ain't, so it must be. So, yeah, it'll be the second. I'm um, planning to uh, do the Every Second Matters show with Ghost tomorrow. Um, I think other people are more than welcome to do the shows. I'm not sure if anybody else is uh, doing a show tomorrow. Don't you do a show tomorrow, Outlaw? Uh, yes, uh, I got one at 6.30 tomorrow afternoon. Uh, yeah. So you're more than welcome to stop in and say hello, G-Webs. Uh, yeah, I got a thing that I'm working on tomorrow. So um, depending on when I'm done, uh, then yeah, I'm more than happy to. Uh, thanks for bringing that up, Gary. Every Second Matters is an awareness campaign we've been doing for, well, since the end of 2013. So I guess it's going on five years where every second day of the month, we try to uh, take a moment or take some time to talk about Second Amendment issues, uh, either stuff that's been going on you know, during that month or stuff that's coming up. Sounds like Trump is about to uh, get rid of bump stocks finally. So we've got that coming for us. And um, uh, I'll probably chat a bit about the Gun Rights Policy Conference again. And uh, Anybody who wants to participate in that, it's an awareness campaign. It's not an entertainment show. It's not a, like, well, Smeggy put some time into coming up with some, uh, I guess, uh, bullet points for the month or kind of the, the two-way summary of the month. Uh, and, other, and, and I've seen a couple other people throughout the years uh, put effort into that kind of thing, either for their state or their region or their area of interest. So anybody is welcome to participate and encouraged to do so. There's no possible way after listening to the AMCON, that to a media summit, that anyone can believe that there are superheroes working for us on behalf of the Second Amendment. There's just not. There are people with tremendous interest and people with you know, great intent. And there's people that have ability, but there's no perfect champion for the Second Amendment that's going to come save the day. Trust me, there is no one. I know 
at least I know or have talked to, everybody who's out there doing efforts and very few of them even give a shit. The people that do, people that have spent their careers doing it have been very effective, but they are seriously not as connected as the four people in this room. Uh, cycle, you, you may not realize it, but you've got more ability and awareness of how to get information up and down. You've been in more, participated in more conversations than uh, publicly, at least, than some of these people who've been in it their entire career. They do this stuff from their room, from a pencil and paper sometimes, you know, from an old, 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 old computer, and it works for them. They're, they've, they've done great things. But if we sit around thinking that they are going to finish it for us, finish that race, you're wrong. These people have been running for a long time, and they have their ways to run, but they are not capable of you know, adapting to whatever's next and, and, and winning. It's going to take effort from everybody. Uh, Gizzard has more coverage online than some of the people that have been doing this their entire lives. Thanks, Gary, for doing that. I hope that you appreciate your value. Outlaw, the consistent amount of shows that you've been doing is every bit as valuable, in my opinion, as some of the people who have been doing this stuff on radio. I don't care how big and how much money and how much effort you put into your radio show. I don't listen to the fucking radio and I'm not the only one out there who doesn't even own a radio. So I don't care how much effort they're putting into this, slapping themselves on the back and getting big giant sponsors to pay for all kinds of things that goes out into the world, out into the atmosphere. Nobody listens to that stuff. So uh, again, value what you're doing. If you're listening to this show, you have some interest in this stuff. Value your input. The new media isn't just a way to you know, talk about the, the way things are. It's the way things are changing. And the people that are participating in it today are laying the foundations for those people that are coming next. And if we continue to just do stuff randomly, we're going to get random results. We can work more efficiently. And that's what Every Second Matters is all about. The potential for us all to collaborate, for us each to amplify and enhance the messages that are already being done by the people that have put their careers into this. So it's not a point fingers. It's not a cast blame. It's a let's work together and get this stuff accomplished. It's not a goal that we're going to cross the finish line to be done. It's mowing the fucking lawn. We have to do it all the time. And if one person thinks that somebody else is going to mow the lawn for him, you're wrong. You all got to get out there and push that mower for a little bit or grab a weed whacker or at least bring somebody some iced tea once in a while. Uh, thanks, you guys, for jumping in. I'm done talking. We'll be back tomorrow for Every Second Matters.